Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk about solubility and we're also going to talk about electrolytes. So this bottle of Gatorade here is a classic example of what we would call an electrolyte solution and I'm definitely going to get into more on what electrolytes are later in this video, but for now I'd like to discuss solubility. So the term solubility refers to how well a solute dissolves in a solvent to make a solution. So to understand solubility, well we need to understand the process by which a solution is made. And this process is appropriately called the solution process. And basically the solution process breaks down like this. What you have is a competition of attractive forces. And there are two types of attractions that compete with one another uh, to determine whether a solution is formed or not. One of those such attractions is called the solute-solute interactions. And these are the attractions that take place between solute particles. Remember the solute, that's the minority component, that's the substance that gets dissolved. So the interaction between those solute particles, those are called the solute-solute interactions. Now the other type of attractive force that competes with the solute-solute interactions is called the solvent-solute interactions. And as the name implies, these are the attractions between solute particles and solvent particles. So as we look at this diagram here where the solute particles are shown in white and the solvent particles are shown in black. The solute-solute interactions are the interactions between these individual white solute particles, okay? And then on the flip side, the solvent-solute interactions are the attractions that take place between the black solute particle and the white uh, the black solvent particle and the white solute particle. And the basic idea uh, as to whether a solution forms or not, well, it all depends on how strong these two types of forces are. And it's the stronger force that's going to prevail. So if the solute-solute interactions are the stronger of the two, then the solute is going to prefer to remain undissolved and you're not going to get a solution. If on the flip side, the solvent-solute interactions are the stronger of the two, well then the solute would rather be dissolved in the solvent and you'll get a solution. So again, it's always the stronger of these two types of attractive forces that's going to prevail, resulting in either an undissolved solid or the formation of, a, of an aqueous solution. So with that in mind, I'd like to switch gears and talk a little bit about electrolyte and non-electrolyte solutions. And for this discussion, I'm going to start off with an experiment. So I got these two beakers right here. Now the beaker on the left side of your screen is going to contain a salt water solution. Right now they're just water, but this is going to, I'm going to add salt to it shortly to make a salt water solution. And then the beaker on your right is going to have a sugar water solution. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to test these solutions to see whether or not they conduct electricity. And what's going to help me test these solutions to see if they conduct electricity is this. So this is two what we call conductivity testers. And the way they work is, well, there are these two leads that point downward and there's a light bulb on top. So this is basically an incomplete circuit, okay? So it's an incomplete circuit. And when these two leads are placed in a conductive material, well, that conductive material is going to complete the circuit and the light bulb is going to glow. So conductivity tester is a good method by which we can test to see if something conducts electricity or if it doesn't. So right now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to test this conductivity tester using a piece of this metal wire here to see if this conductivity tester works. So it may work, it may not work, the light bulb might need to be replaced, and we're gonna test that out right now by just touching the leads of the conductivity tester to this wire, and we'll see what happens. Okay. So we have established that this conductivity tester does work because when we touched it to this uh, conductive piece of metal, we connected those leads together, that completed the circuit, and the light bulb came on. So now we're ready to, I already know the other one works, now we're ready to test solutions to see if they conduct electricity. So again, the beaker on the left side of your screen, that's going to contain a salt water solution. So I'm going to prepare that right now just by adding some salt to this beaker of water. So I'm gonna add plenty of salt in there to this beaker. And I'm gonna stir that around with a spoon to make a nice aqueous solution of salt water. And in a little bit, we're gonna see if this conducts electricity or not. So I'm stirring that around. 
makes a nice aqueous sodium chloride solution. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare the other solution, the speaker on the right side of your screen. That's going to be sugar water. So I got some sugar over here. And I'm going to add it to the water carefully to make a nice aqueous solution of sugar, glucose. So I'm going to stir that around nice and good. And that will make an aqueous glucose solution. So when we make this solution, it kind of looks like the solute, in this case glucose, is sort of disappearing in the water, but that's only because it's dissolved. It's still there, it's just it's been dissolved by water. And if I wanted to make sure that it's still there, I could just taste the solution and it would be very sweet. Sodium chloride, by contrast, would be very salty. So let's go ahead and test these two solutions out using the conductivity testers, okay? So I got, again, I got the salt water solution on the left, and I got the sugar water solution on the right. Salt water, sugar water, salt water, sugar water. So let's start by testing the salt water solution to see if it conducts electricity. If it does, the light bulb will come on. Okay, so when I dip the leads of the conductivity tester into the salt water solution, the light comes on, therefore salt water conducts electricity. So that was a positive test. Now let's try the same with the sugar water solution. So I dip the leads of the conductivity tester into that sugar solution. The leads are fully submerged in the, sh the sugar solution, but their light bulb just isn't coming on. So the sugar water does not conduct electricity. So it's a yes for the salt water and a no for the sugar water. So what's going on here? Why did that happen? Why is it that the salt water solution conducted electricity, but the sugar water solution didn't? Well, it all has to do with what happened when each of these two solutes dissolved in the water. Now we can see that both of them dissolved, but again, different processes were actually occurring. Now in the case of the salt water, what took place was the ionic bonds holding the sodium and chloride ions together, they broke apart and that released individual sodium ions and individual chloride ions floating around in that solution. Now these ions, they act as charge carriers. So they act as a conductive material that allows electric current to pass through and that's why we got uh, that light bulb coming on. So this is what we would call an electrolyte solution. On the other hand, when we dissolved glucose in water, the glucose, that's the C6H12O6, well, it didn't make ions in solution. It just went from solid glucose to aqueous glucose. So it dissolved in the water, that's for sure. However, those glucose molecules remained intact. They didn't break apart, they didn't make any ions. And so this is what we call a non-electrolyte solution. So we can see here that ionic compounds, when they dissolve in water, they release ions and they make elect electrolytes, just like sodium chloride. When molecular compounds such as glucose dissolve in water, they don't make ions, and so they, you get a non-electrolyte solution. So a little bit more about electrolytes. At this point, we know that electrolytes are nothing more than an aqueous solution with ions floating around, and those ions, of course, act as charge carriers, allowing electric current to pass through. So ionic compounds dissolved in water, these would be an example of what we call a strong electrolyte, because when you take an ionic compound and dissolve it in water, all of those ionic bonds break and you get a complete what we call dissociation of that ionic compound into its constituent ions. Now not all ionic compounds do this. There are some that don't. There are some ionic compounds that we call insoluble and in a, uh, in a video that follows we're going to talk about uh, solubility of uh, different types of ionic compounds but we'll, uh, we'll discuss that and cross that bridge when we get to it. And then with molecular compounds like glucose, well, those are non-electrolytes, again, because they didn't make any ions in solution. So molecular compounds don't make electrolytes, but there is one important exception to this, and that exception has to do with acids. So we're going to talk about acids in much, much more detail later on, but for now, all we need to know about acids is that they are molecular compounds yet they form ions when you put them in water. And there are two types of acids that are called strong acids and weak acids. So a strong acid is an acid that completely ionizes in solution. And a good example of a strong acid would be hydrochloric acid or HCl. And when you put hydrochloric acid in water, 
even though it's a molecular compound, it breaks up into H plus ions and uh, Cl minus ions, so hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Notice that there's a single headed arrow separating the reactant from the products. This single headed arrow indicates a complete dissociation into ions. That means that all of the HCl has dissolved and broken up into H plus and Cl minus. Strong acid, complete dissociation. And this would result in something that we call a, a strong electrolyte solution, just like what we saw earlier with the sodium chloride solution. Because we got that complete dissociation, that results in a lot of ions floating around, and that gives us a nice strong electrolyte. Then there's weak acids. Now weak acids, they do break apart into ions when you put them in water, but they don't break apart completely. They're sort of inefficient at breaking apart, if you will. And a good example of a weak acid is uh, cyanic acid, HCN. So when HCN dissolves in water, it's going to break up into H plus ions and these uh, CN minus ions, these cyanide ions, but it doesn't break up completely. And notice here that instead of a single headed arrow, what we have is a uh, is our, our two arrows that are sort of half headed, they have you know half head, half arrow heads, and they're pointing in opposite directions. Now this type of arrow indicates that you have an incomplete dissociation, so that means that uh, you have uh, H plus and you have CN minus, but you also have some HCN floating around in there too. And so this would result in what we would call a weak electrolyte solution. So if we were to put an aqueous solution of HCN uh, in the conductivity tester, well, what we would see is the, the uh, light bulb would glow, but it would sort of glow uh, dimly. It wouldn't glow as strongly as, uh, as a strong acid solution would make it glow. So we got strong electrolytes. That's uh, when you have either a strong acid or an ionic compound dissolving to get a complete dissociation of ions into that water. And then you have weak electrolytes, which result from weak acids, such as HCN over here. And then we have those non-electrolytes like glucose, which are uh, which take place when you dissolve a molecular compound in water that is not an acid, and therefore it does not break up into ions. So that's it. I hope you found this video enjoyable as uh, as I did. I had a lot of fun making this video for you. Uh, so if you have any questions, make sure to submit them in the form of a comment. And that's it. So all the best.